infants born to a mother under 18 suffer from 60% higher risk of dying in the first year of their life when compared to infants born to a mother aged 19 or older. Girls who, ha who become pregnant below the age of 15 in poor countries have double the risk of maternal death and obstetric fistula than older women. In addition, girls under the age Girls under age 15 are five times more likely to die from maternity-related causes than women under 20. The statistics that are provided, therefore, represent tragedy in the lives of real human beings. This problem is most severe in the northwest and northeast, but the north-central zone also fares worse than the three zones in the south. Let me state at this point that the issues faced by women go beyond girl-child education, early marriage, and poverty. Educated women still have to deal with issues of equal opportunities in the workplace and unwritten but no less gen real gender discrimination. As Governor of Central Bank and Chairman of the Bankers Committee, I forced the question of addressing the gendered workplace to, to the fore. We officially adopted a policy of aiming for at least 50% of, of employees of banks and the CBN being female by 2014. <laughs> also, to address glass ceilings, we pushed for at least 40% of senior management in the CBN and banks, as well as 30% of the board of directors being female. By, <laughs> by the time I left CBN, I had ensured that the myth that women were only good enough to run human resources and medical services, which are more suited to what is called rather condescendingly their nature. In addition to these two departments, I appointed women as directors in charge of core technical areas in the central bank, including banking supervision, risk management, customer protection, internal audit, branch operations, and the governor's special advice on environmental sustainability and governance policy. <laughs> By deliberately pushing for the promotion of outstanding and highly competent female staff, we showed the industry that we, what, what could be achieved by women. We also developed and launched in 2013 a 220 billion Naira MSME development fund with a condition that 60% of it has to be devoted to female entrepreneurs and businesses. I declared 2012 as the year of women economic power and trained NDIC and CBN employees and management staff on sustainability and gender. Female and also in collaboration, ILO, with ILO, we launched FAMOS, Female and Male Operated Small Businesses Toolkit, specifically to measure how much financial institutions serve their female clients. I'm going over this now to make a point that my, my engagement with issues of gender and opportunity for women did not begin when I became an emir. <laughs> and my current engagement with forced marriages, domestic violence, arbitrary divorce, property and maintenance rights for women ETC is not new. It is also not a politically motivated attack on any. The point I seek to stress is that BBOG needs to transform itself from a group defined by the narrow focus of an incident to one that addresses the broader social reality of African women and particularly women in Nigeria, especially the North. We all claim to be horrified by what Boko Haram has done. We all call this primitive and barbaric. They forcefully took our young girls out of school, forced them into marriages without their consent or love, impregnated them, and turned them into mothers at a young age and exposed them to serious health risks, maybe, maybe inflicted beatings and verbal abuse on them. We're all horrified, really. But let us pause a little. These things that horrify us, do they not happen every day in every village in the north and some parts of the south? Do these girls complete their education? Do they all grow up and give their consent to marriage when they're old enough? Does domestic violence not happen? It is often not the fault of the girls or their parents. What do they do if, they're not, if there are no educational or health facilities made available to the poor? So the discourse on gender has to be looked at in the context of the discourse on poverty and governance. And this is why many people are not comfortable. The fact is that poverty in the North and in Nigeria is not inevitable, but as a result of decades of failed social policy. 
It is only by recognizing this and accepting it that we can even hope to make progress. If we do not, then the society to which these girls are brought back to will be no better than where they are now. Let me conclude with a few remarks. Anyone who challenges a system or fights for the voiceless must be ready for serious backlash. Character assassination, slander, blackmail, and intimidation are the normal tools employed by those who defend and profit from the status quo. The poor people for whom you fight are voiceless by necessity. Those of us who are fortunate to be part of the elite and who choose not to speak for them are voiceless by choice. We want to protect ourselves and our loved ones from the pain of being insulted and abused on social media. We want to hold on to small comforts of our status. We want to access power and to be seen as friends of those in power and members of our inner circle. Circle. We are afraid of being destroyed by ruthless state missionary. We have a morbid fear of being isolated, of not belonging to an exclusive club close to power. The reality is that everything in this world is fragile. Life itself will come to an end and we lose money and position and loved ones all the time. The only thing we have control over is who we are, what we stand for, what we represent. Being a coward or a sycophant will, no, will not add one day to your life or one day to the term of any of, or one day to the term of, or one day to the term of any of the things you hold dear. The worst silence is that which happens in the face of injustice. Do not be intimidated, do not be silenced, do not betray your conscience or sell your soul. Do not fear any human being. Stand up and take all the bullets that are fired at you, but never kneel down. If you have to die, please die standing and not on your knees. Most important, most important, ignore the noise. Do not defend yourself too much against personal attacks because they want your person, not the issues you raise to be discussed. I know it is tough. I go through this every day, but I have learned that after all the insults and blackmail, the issues remain and, we, and will not disappear until they are addressed. That is your task. Put these issues on the table and do not walk away until they're resolved. Thank you for your kind attention, and we pray that Allah return all our girls and boys safely. I miss you. So I just want to tell you that we're making history here because this is the first time ever that a non-title holder is representing the Emir wow. in the North. <laughs> to add to that, a woman is representing him. <laughs> BBOG is very close to my heart, not just as a woman or a girl, but as a human, because I do think that this is a fight that every human being should join. And as my father said, there are 12 of us that are ready to take his place if anything happens. And not just that, you know, my daughter is right here. And for some reason, I think as a new mother, I'm more passionate about this than I've ever been. So I got very emotional watching the videos, just thinking about parents sitting at home and not knowing what condition their children are in. So some people say that they think my father would keep quiet because he wants to hold on to, th to his throne. I think they don't know my father because I know that he has always wanted to be the Emir of Kano. But to him, if it comes between doing what is right, you know, what his conscience, what his conscience tells him and choosing his throne, he would happily give up the throne.
So my father has always been a part of one controversy or the other. And it's normal for us. We're not scared anymore. We used to be once upon a time. <laughs>